Uh, lines are open. Good morning to you. Lines are open at 888-77-JESSE, 888-77-53773. I have some very interesting guests lined up for you today. My first uh, guest is uh, Larry Highcoke. Highcoke. He is a coordinator of East Bay Atheist. And we're going to talk to Larry about uh, atheist, atheism. And if you'd like to speak with Larry, you can call in at 888-77-53773. That's 888-77-JESSE. Jesse is no I without the I, J-E-S-S-E. Good morning, Larry. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Hi, thank you for having me. By the way, my last name is spell is actually pronounced Hickok. My ancestors didn't know how to spell. Oh, Hickok. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Larry. Thank you. Appreciate that, Hickok. Um, Larry, you are the coordinator of East Bay Atheists. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how long have you been an atheist, and how did you become an atheist? Uh, I became an atheist in the 60s when I was about 12. I uh, was brought up Protestant, but it never really stuck. I really didn't think about it a whole lot. It was sort of a social thing you do on Sundays. And then uh, I read this book, uh, History of the Western World by Harry Barnes, and it pointed out that Christianity, almost all of the tenets of Christianity, and the customs of Christianity have been borrowed from all these different prior religions. And to me, that really said Christianity uh, is not something that came from God's Word. It's simply something that developed as mythology. So I quickly began calling myself an atheist. It was not a difficult uh, transition. I guess I never really bought into the original ideas. I just sort of, you know, they were just sort of there. And this happened at the age of 12. Yeah. And your your father and mother were Protestants. They were Protestant. Uh, my mother has since converted to being a Mennonite. Uh, my mother is very, very fundamentalist religiously. My father was religious, but not too serious about it. How did they feel about you converting at the age of 12? Well, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a conversion. It's more like letting go of... Uh, of a religion, uh, because there's nothing that I really, you know, there was no great all-encompassing word to substitute for the religion. They didn't like it at all. My mother was very upset, and my father talked to me about, you know, uh, not talking to my mother about religion because it upset her so much. Wow. And so what do you believe in now? Well, I like to say I don't really believe in anything. Uh, I have values. Uh, I certainly think that community is important. I think that people should uh, practice the golden rule. I think that they should do it not because they're told to do it, but because it feels good to uh, do fun th- to do good things to other people. I think empathy is a very positive human trait. Uh, uh, I think that uh, people who accept everything that their culture tells them are a problem for the world. I think all of us need to be somewhat skeptical thinkers and and look at what we're told and look at the evidence and examine all the things that uh, we grow up with as uh, pre-established realities as not necessarily being valid. So you believe in those things then because you you have to believe in something. We live by faith. We We live by what we believe in. So you believe in those things you just named off. Well, actually, I I take a different uh, uh, perspective on that because, uh, precisely, I think that belief is a construct of faith. Without faith, you really can't have belief. And so uh, I reject faith. My primary emphasis is that faith, which uh, is very, has a very uh, similar definition to bias. In other words, it's uh, conclusions uh, not based on or in the face of Uh, or in contradiction to uh, physical evidence and logic. I I reject faith. Uh, I think we just have to always be skeptical thinkers and, you know, look at the world the way it is. But there is no difference. There is no difference that I can see between faith and belief because whatever you... I'm sorry? I agree. I don't believe anything. But you do believe something. No, I don't believe anything. You believe in those values that you just named off. It's not a belief. 
Yeah, those are values, but they're not blue. So you don't expect those 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 values that you just named off, you don't expect them to work? Oh, yeah, but that doesn't mean that they're believed. So you don't believe that they will work? No, I don't believe anything. Belief is a something that's based on faith, and I try to really stay away from that so that I can stay open to new evidence. I think you don't realize that you do believe in something, even if it's a rebellious against Christianity or against God, that is a belief. When you believe there is no God, that is a belief. I don't believe there's no God. I conclude there's no God based on a lack of evidence for the proposition that there's a God. Where do you get your values from? Uh, The Christians get their values from the God of the Bible. Where do you get your values from? Where do they come from? Uh, They come from my social experience, somewhat from my parents, somewhat from a sense of just looking at the world and seeing what I think is right and wrong. For example, when I was very young, uh, I uh, looked at uh, the Vietnam War, and I did not like it. It felt what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam felt very wrong to me. And so I became very active in trying to fight that war. Uh, it, do, you, uh, do you have more values? Yeah. Do you believe there is a right and wrong or good and evil? I think right and wrong and good and evil are very, very uh, strong, absolute terms. I think most things have various shades of gray. Uh, is it wrong for a, an adult woman to molest a teenage boy? I think that that is, um, yes, I think that that is inappropriate. I think it can do harm to the boy. Is it wrong? Is it wrong? Well, see, we're getting into uh, terminology. No, I'm, I'm just I'm asking. I asked first if there's a right. I asked if there's a right or wrong. You said yes. And so I ask, is it wrong for a woman to molest a teenage boy? Okay, I'll, I'll work with your terminology uh, just for the sake of avoiding argument. Yeah, I would say it was wrong, yes. Okay, and, and what are you bu- basing that value on? I'm basing that value on the scientific knowledge that uh, when young people have uh, sex with much older people at a point where they're really not truly developed enough emotionally and psychologically to get into sexual relationships, that that tends to leave them scarred emotionally. And so the value is that I uh, empathize with people and I don't want to see them scarred emotionally. Larry, were you uh, were you close to your father while growing up? No, uh. Uh-uh. And were you closer to your mother? Yeah. And why weren't you close to your father? My father was a uh, very angry, uh, very ruthless man. In what way? He he treated my mother and I very abusively, verbally. And why did he do that? He was afraid. Uh, of what? Uh, that's a long, long discussion. Man. So have you ever gone to him and talked to him about that? No. Actually, my father and I had a very poor relationship. He died 12 years ago, and uh, I really stopped talking to him long ago. Could it be one of the reasons that you stopped believing in God at the age of 12 was because of your lack of proper relationship with your earthly father? I think that uh, there's a certain validity to that, Um, and the reason being that, well, there's two reasons. One, that a strict father, uh, my father was rather modeled after the God of the Old Testament. He was very strict, very demanding, very jealous, very vengeful. Uh, Secondly, the other thing that affects that, a reason I think there's some validity to that argument, is that... uh, <clears throat> when you're young, uh, the infant mind absorbs everything it's told. Uh, it's rather like a sponge. And uh, you come to associate all those things that you were brought up with uh, with the love of your parents. And it's difficult to let go of these things uh, when you have extreme love for your parents because it feels like you're, uh, you're, you're not loving your parents. Right. And indeed, you know, as we mentioned earlier, my parents were upset when I uh, deconverted. So 
So in that sense, uh, <clears throat> there's a certain blessing uh, in having a uh, dysfunctional family simply because <laughs> it allows you to actually examine evidence rather than uh, work on emotion. So your father was a false imitation of the God of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, why don't you forgive him? Why won't you forgive him? Oh, I, uh, I do forgive him on a considerable level. He was just really afraid. But you haven't forgiven him for the way he treated you. Well, I think there are some things you really can't forgive. Uh, I feel sorry for him. I don't primarily feel anger at him anymore. I feel sorry for him. What gives you the right to feel sorry for anyone? You're not, feel, everyone because you're not, has the right to uh, have uh, emotions and feelings, whatever they might be. But no one has the right to feel sorry for another person because it gives the impression that you're better than that person. Hmm. Eight 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 seven seven Jesse lines are wide open. That makes sense. Uh, I think you're well to an extent. Yeah, okay. I would say to an extent. I wouldn't. I don't think of it in those terms. You but yeah, I mean, really, uh, it does mean to a, a considerable extent that uh, um, I was able to let go of a lot of the fear that my parents had, particularly my father. Oh, okay. Larry, hold on. Let me take a quick break. One eight 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 seven seven Jesse. No I in the Jesse. That is eight 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 seven seven five three seven seven three. Jesse Lee Peterson. Larry Hickok is my guest. Be back in a moment, Larry. Just hold on. Thanks. All right, we are back. Jesse Lee Peterson is here. Lines are open. Larry Hickok is my guest. He's the coordinator for East Bay Atheist. And uh, we're going to tell you how to get in contact with them. I know there are many people out there who have turned away from God for whatever reason, and they believe that there is or don't believe in God. Larry, do you believe there is no God, or you just don't believe in him? Uh, I don't believe in any God. I I have never seen any evidence to point to uh, the existence of a God. Um, Is there uh, a difference between man and animal? Only in the level of intelligence. Uh, and what do you mean by that? Uh, man has a larger brain and is more intelligent than the other animal. And that's the only difference? Yeah, because of the, the intelligence uh, allows them to have consciousness and to develop uh, um, things like morality. And so man has a conscience, whereas animals, animals do not have a conscience. Okay. Is that true? I would say that's probably the case, yeah. Okay. I was talking about consciousness. Right. And so yeah. if it's true that man has a conscious and animals don't, how did that happen if it wasn't created by God? Well, I think it was, uh, I forget the timeline, but uh, there's, I mean, it's actually been shown, scientifically shown, that the human brain made a huge leap Uh a number of years ago, and the modern brain was uh, was developed through uh, through evolution. Uh, the idea that uh, thing that that creation, as creationists would put it, as theists would put it, the idea that the world is so complex that it must have been created by a god uh, is is a logical fallacy. Because for that, certainly that god is far more complex than the world that he created by definition. Therefore, why, where did he come from? Who created him? Well, of course, the, the usual answer is he's always there. He's always been there. Well, that's just allowing basically that your proposition doesn't have to follow from the same logic that my proposition does. How did man come about? Evolution. He evolved from what? Evolved from apes and earlier uh, uh, bacteria. Why haven't we seen man evolving from ape since you've been around? <laughs> Took millions and millions of years. Uh, and so, but Dawkins we never see a, it. Dawkins has a analogy, a metaphor that's really very good. 
he calls it Mount Improbable. And the argument that you're, uh, that you're making is basically the argument that one uh, 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 would make uh, about climbing this mountain if one were sitting on the side, if one were standing at the base of the mountain where it's a sheer cliff and it's really, really high. However, uh, evolution is not a matter of an immediate leap. Evolution is a matter of slow transformation over many, 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 many years. Uh, far more years than we can really comprehend because we just not, haven't been around that long. So uh, Dawkins' metaphor is you walk around to the back side of that mountain, and there there's a slow, gradual trail all the way up to the top of the mountain. And so man was, I mean, man evolved from ape. Mm-hmm. And then well, we had, we had, uh, we, had uh, we shared uh, forefathers, ancestors. And so when a baby is born of woman, does it look like an ape? It is evolving from ape at that point? Where do you get that? I'm asking you. I mean, why don't we see man evolving from ape today? We should I, at some point see it somewhere at some time, right? No. Why not? Well, it took, it took place over millions of years. Evolution is a very, very slow process. And what happens is, uh, to give an analogy, uh, uh, to give an actual example of evolution, uh, there is a moth in England which was black. And that was actually uh, because the British used to use lots and lots of very primitive coal plants for power. And so the trees and plants had a lot of black soot all over them. Well, when they started cleaning up their emissions and cleaning up their air, that particular moth turned white because then it could blend in better with the, uh, the new color of the, or maybe not white, let's say uh, much lighter brown. And then it could blend in much better with the color of the foliage. Simply a matter of uh, natural selection. Uh, there's a very small mutation, and the question is, does that mutation allow the organism a better chance of survival than before the mutation. And it's always in very small increments, and whenever that happens, whenever that mutation does result in better survivability, what happens is that the, uh, the mutation is passed on because those people, those, those moths or those chimps or those humans or whatever, um, survive, and their genes uh, are passed on. Do apes have conscious? Not as far as with consciousness. Not as far as consciousness. With no, uh-uh. they don't. Mm-hmm. And so, how did man evolve it from ape, end up with consciousness, but apes don't have it? Well, I mentioned that earlier. It's the size of the brain. I mean, there've been a lot of very involved books. I know, but shouldn't we have? Shouldn't man have the same brain that ape has? Well, we know they don't. Uh, there, there's actually a. I mean, they have discovered the link. They have actually discovered the timeline for the evolution of the human brain. Back a long time ago, uh, an ape-like creature mutated with a slightly larger brain. Uh, Larry, and you really believe all this stuff you're saying? I don't believe anything. This is what science concludes and you, based on evidence. But you believe science, right? I don't believe... I don't have the need for a belief. I don't... You know, my knuckles aren't tightly cra- uh, grasping this, uh, this, these beliefs. But do you this believe? Is, so you don't believe the conclusions of science. And so you don't. You do huge, not believe. There's you, a huge amount of evidence supporting this. So you do not believe the evidence that science has presented to you. No, I don't. I don't believe evidence. Belief is based on faith. Evidence is the opposite of faith. So how do you know science is correct if you don't believe it? Because it's based on physical evidence, and all knowledge flows from physical evidence. One eight eight valid knowledge. Eight 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 seven seven Jesse. Eight 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 seven seven Jesse. Let's go to the phones here. Um, oh, I think I just lost that caller. <laughs> um, Larry, is there an attack on atheists today in America? Is there an attack? Um, well. To a certain extent, there are some uh, critics who 
who are basically saying that people like Dawkins with his best-selling book, The God Delusion, people like Bennett, uh, people like uh, Sam Harris, The End of Faith, uh, they're saying that these people are just being too hard on religion. Uh, and they're saying that that's inappropriate and that we should just be more um, tolerant of uh, faith. Um, I really disagree with that. I think that faith, uh, the idea that you have these absolute beliefs based on nothing other than supposed revelation, uh, is extremely destructive, and I think it's going to destroy our species if we can't get beyond it. I, I've noticed that atheists are hypocrites in that they want to remove God from the public square. They don't want him mentioned in public schools or on the playgrounds or in government. They, they are fighting to remove him from the Pledge of Allegiance. And rather than going out and just being an atheist and leaving God alone, they're trying to remove him. Why are they so hypocritical in their movement? How is that hypocritical? Why, why, if God is there, why would they want to remove him? If God is there, where? You mean if God is Within being the, mentioned in the school? Right, in the public square, in the schools and government. Why are atheists upset about that rather than just going on and believing in what they believe in and leaving that alone? Let me think a moment about this uh, to know how to approach your question. Um, well, first of all, um, this country was basically founded uh, by people who felt that religion should stay out of government. That's and not true. And they didn't have an absolute feeling about that. But that's that. not true, Larry. Well, it is. It's not true, but it's, go ahead and make your point. Okay, and uh, the reason for that, as many of them argued, is that uh, whenever religion, and that most of them were religious in one way or another, nearly all of them, but whenever religion gets the support of government, it becomes corrupted. Um, you mentioned the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, the Pledge of Allegiance had nothing about God until the Knights of Columbus and the McCarthy area managed to get it in. That was in the 50s. Before that, there was, there was nothing about God. And actually, the Pledge of Allegiance itself was developed in the late 1800s by a socialist minister who, who, who indeed kept God out of it. So originally, there was no Pledge of Allegiance. Um, but the point, Larry, is within the Pledge, however it got, got there, I'm not sure what you're saying is true or not, but however it got there, it is there. And you have a few atheists coming out now fighting to remove God from the Pledge of Allegiance, as they have done within the public school system around the country. My question is, why, why are they doing that? Why don't they just be an atheist and, and let those who want to believe in God or, or, or mention his name within the Pledge of Allegiance stay that way? Because you don't have to, atheists do not have to pledge allegiance to the flag. They can stay quiet. Why are they so hypocritical in their movement? Well, again, there's nothing hypocritical about that. Let's look at the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance in this in California uh, is not mandatory. However, it is mandatory that you observe a moment of silence, and I think actually you have to stand up. Now, but you don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything. Now, what's the effect of being silent in a school environment? The the effect is that one is socially ostracized. Uh, another example, uh, well, well, look, it's like this. Uh, how would uh, someone of another religion feel uh, if they were uh, being, okay, in fact, let's just say this. How would you feel if atheism were predominant in this country? It was the predominant culture. And so uh, your kids in school were told basically continually that there's no God. And your, uh, your, your children uh, pledged allegiance to uh, the flag with absolutely no God involved. How would you feel about that? Well, I would realize that that is the system that I live in, and I would take my child out and teach them myself. Well, I think that public education is a very strong American value. It's what has 
really help to make our country great. I would never take my child out of public education if there's any way to avoid it. Public uh, education what you're, what you're has not giving is the the uh, what you're basically giving is the uh, the rule of the majority, majoritarian rule. Is that correct? First, I want to say that public education has destroyed this country rather than build it up. That's not true that it's done good. It's done very bad. Uh, uh, it's brainwashed a nation and nearly destroyed us. I'll let you comment on that and answer the other part of your question. 888-77-53-773. 888-77-JESSE. I'll be back in a moment. Thanks. Welcome back. Yes, this is a man's world. One eight 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 seven seven Jesse. We're talking to Larry Hickok. He is the um, coordinator of the East Bay Atheist Group there, and uh, trying to get a little more understanding about what is their purpose. Why? Why are they trying to remove God out of the public square? Larry, I want to ask, and then I, I want you to give out information to the folks as to how to get in contact with your organization. But I want to ask. Do you personally believe that the mention of God or the name of God should remove, be removed from the public school system, from the government, from the public square? Do you personally believe that? Well, as I said before, I choose not to use the word believe. Well, do you uh, think he should be removed? strong conviction. I think that it is really important that religion, if it is mentioned in government, uh, for example, in public schools and governmental agencies like public schools, I think that it should be taught as comparative religion. Uh, all religions should be given, given the same standard, including non-religion, the lack of religion. This is a lot of what's happened in Europe, and it's actually what's been highly, uh, largely responsible uh, for um, the growth of atheism in Europe. But look how, when people look at, are actually, when all the different religions are given simple objective study, one finds a lot of reasons not to believe. But as a result of that, look what Europe is becoming. It's a, it's a, as, as in this country, if you notice, Larry, whenever you remove, the, remove God from the hearts and minds of the people, then all hell break, breaks loose, as it has done in the public school system. Well, I'm not quite sure what you're saying about the public school system, and that seems like a, a some, something of a sidetrack there. Uh, I can also tell you that Adolf Hitler said something very similar to that, and his party was absolutely dedicated to uh, destroying atheism. But Hitler uh, did not believe in God either. He was a Roman Catholic. He continually said that but, he was a Roman No, but Catholic. he turned away from that. No, he, he continually said his party's and his party's uh, statements, political statements, said that. There are many pictures of top Nazis uh, with top cardinals. But Hitler, okay. you're right, he grew up in a Catholic environment, but he later denounced it and became Hitler. <laughs> well, I, I'm saying that's not true. That's simply just not true. Now, now let's, let's, take, let's see if we can take a few calls for you. Uh, let's go to... Thank you for calling. You're on with Larry. Hello? Hi. Yeah, thanks for calling you on the air. What's your name? Hello? Hi. Oh, hold on a minute here, Larry, maybe. I can hear him. Yeah, I can hear him too, but apparently. <laughs> can you hear me now? Uh, if you're talking to me, I can hear you. What's your name? Martin. Okay, you're on the air. Thanks for calling. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to ask your guest. Now, he just made a statement a while back where he said, all knowledge comes from physical. Evidence. Now, now that, is that what you said? Did I, I said get that all right? knowledge comes from physical evidence, yes. Right, right. Um, if that was true, there would be no new knowledge ever. Because physical evidence alone is not what an inventor uses to come up with new stuff. And if you just look at um, the science fiction cartoons and movies, you'll see none of that stuff exists. None of that stuff's even reality. So that'll tell you right away that thoughts are not even physical. Because if thoughts were physical, then it would could only reflect a physical world. So here you have thoughts acting on the physical to bring about a new reality. 
and the thoughts themselves not being physical, because if they were, they would just reflect reality. And just from the science, just from science fiction, we know that thoughts are not just a reflection of reality. So that premise right there is crazy. Can you respond to that, Larry? Uh, it seems to me to be very confused thinking. Uh, no one says that the relationship between thought and reality is mechanistic and totally and completely, uh, I see reality and my brain mirrors it and that's the end of it. Consciousness involves the ability to think, the ability to uh, develop models and then test them. The physical nature of what we're talking about here, for example, with those inventions, is that once one has a concept based on science and reality of how to do something that... It's not based on... Is it based on science and reality? There's Let me always new science based on thought. See, Let me finish. You're putting science... You're putting the cart leading the horse. Science doesn't lead... It, it's thought that leads science. It's not science that leads thought. And, and, and I've just proved by way of wacky thoughts you know, thoughts that don't reflect reality at all, don't reflect the physical at all, like, you know, laser beams coming out of someone's hand. You know, we're talking about Spider-Man and all those superheroes, right? Thoughts can come up with stuff that doesn't even exist and can never exist. So now we know that thoughts don't come from the physical world. They have nothing to do with the physical world. But some, some do. And so you have the, the thoughts now rearranging and coming up with um, and exposing what's true in the physical world. So now where do thoughts come from? Well, what you have just done is very uh, rudely interrupted me. And secondly, what you have just done is make an argument which you, you, you find brilliant and, uh, you know, I'm very unimpressed with. Uh, I was trying to explain to you uh, the validity of thoughts, which, again, you seem to imply this when you were just interrupting me, the, the valid thoughts are those which work out in physical reality. In other words, if you invent the wheel, you then find that it enables you to uh, develop a structure based on a wheel that will carry loads. So the wheel is valid. Now, if you make a rectangular wheel, you find that it will not work. So uh, that is what we're talking about here in terms of... Uh, knowledge being based on evidence, based on uh, what your knowledge of what you see and what you think, and then it's based on developing theories from there, and then taking those hypotheses and testing them, seeing if they work. The square wheel doesn't work. The round one does. Where do you get the first With impression of the wheel? When you, sit, when you want to do a wheel, <clears throat> where do you get that first impression of the wheel? Where does that come Probably from? Probably you see a rock rolling down a hill. <laughs> and then you say, wow, look at how easily it moves. You know, my premise is actually leading you back to, um, away from the physical, and, 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 and back to where does thought come from. Uh -huh. So that's all my argument was trying to show you, is that thought is not of this world. So if thought is not of this world, where does it come from? Because all thought does not reflect this world, and 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 even and it can even rearrange and just and, and bring out of the world stuff that was not visible by the naked eye. So where does thought come from then? It comes from the action if it just of comes the brain. From, if it just came from the action of the brain chemicals, then it would always reflect where it's coming from. It could not reflect something that's not there. So that is not true. It comes from where. I'm sorry, I find your argument nonsensical. The idea beyond that you what could, you yeah, can you're interrupting say. again. It's coming from beyond what you hold, can say because you're you're just physical. Hold on one minute, Martin. Just let him respond. And in and denial. Martin, hold on a minute. Go All ahead, right. Larry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, thought is a, is not a simple mechanistic representation of uh, what we see in reality. Thought is a process where we take in our, uh, our sensory input and uh, we also use our emotion, hopefully not too excessively, and we develop ideas and then we proceed to test those ideas in the physical world. Uh, this is where knowledge 
Uh, this is the way that knowledge is developed. Uh, you know, there are plenty of philosophers of consciousness who um, have written about this. Uh, I rather doubt that uh, uh, Martin's particular take on it uh, has a lot of uh, academic uh, support. Final word, Martin? Oh, me, well, because a lot of the academic world, they're all stuck in the physical world, and they cannot see beyond. And, and it seems to me, looking back in history, that the, the real revolutionary thinkers were, were consciousness God-based, in other words. They realized that, there's, that there is a, a vision beyond what their physical eyes can see and their, and their mind can create. Their, even their own thought is very limited to only what their experience is, and there's something beyond that that, that got these guys to come up with the radical um, way to look at the world that, that changed science. And uh, today's scientists, a lot of them are they're just stuck in a rut, stuck in the physical world. They can't go beyond it. But there they don't are, have too many revolutionary things, there are unless they're coming from those kind of people. There are scientists out there who would disagree with what Larry is saying and scientists who are trying to prove that there is no God. God is hidden from most people who don't want... He hides himself from people who don't want to seek him. Yeah. So... So those people who say he doesn't exist, we have no evidence. They're not. They're never going to find him. And the the greatest uh, d- um, discoverers of physical reality are the ones who are connected to God. It's that's that's the history of science. Yeah, like Galileo. Is that true? Um, well, yeah. you're the expert. Is it? It is. I'm saying it is. Mm -hmm. Galileo was uh, tortured by the Inquisition. Well, there's there's always been... Well, Jesus was tortured by the Pharisees, but that doesn't mean that uh, um, Jesus wasn't of God. It doesn't mean that Galileo wasn't of God because he was tortured by the the Christian rulers at the time. You You gave a proposition that uh, uh, people who have... saying men of God. I didn't say... You have made yeah, uh, you gave a proposition by that the people who have by truly made a difference in science, if I heard you correctly, are the yeah, people the who are able to look beyond the physical the... world and be inspired by God. Right. Yeah, okay. I commented, uh, like Galileo, and you said, I don't know. How can, no, you, make, how can you make statements about... Well, Galileo was... Well, yeah, you know, you've just uh, proven that Galileo is... is, is, is um, a man who, a man of God, because he wasn't, he wasn't um, uh, just held down by the beliefs of the day, and he 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 could see he could see beyond what normal people would see, and those normal people are usually the haters, the ones who hate God, and of course when they, when they hate something that comes from God, they'll hate the man that brings it out too, and so they 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 tortured him. Just like, just like people who hate the science that shows, um, um, you know, that, that, that points as much to God as the, as the atheists want to try to prove that science points away from God. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate your call. Great call. All right. Thank you. All right. 888-77-JESSE, 888-77-53773. Larry, I noticed that, and, and I don't know, I, I wouldn't, I don't think all atheists are like this, but I notice most of them tend to hate God. They hate people who uh, believe in God. Why is that? Well, first of all, how can you hate uh, a being that doesn't exist? I know, but why do they hate the people who believe that he does exist? Uh, I don't think they do. I don't know any atheists who hate uh, theists. Uh, I know atheists who hate what religion has done. Let me hold, hold, that, hold that thought, Larry. I yeah. want to come back to that. 888-77-53773. Back in a moment. Okay, we're back. Larry Hecka is my guest coordinator for the East Bay Atheists. And uh, Larry, uh, why do atheists hate or angry? Why are they angry at people who believe in God? Oh, I'm sorry. 
we've been having today. Hello? No, I, I'm sorry, Larry. You're back on now. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. In this conversation we've been having uh, for the last few minutes, uh, I haven't said anything negative about theists. Uh, you have said a number of things very negative about atheists. <laughs> but I notice that they're very angry at Christians, and why is that? But well, you, made a, you made a good point in going out of, on break there. You said it was because... Of the things that religion has done. I mean, religion has held back science to a remarkable degree. It's, it's persecuted science. Uh, Galileo accepted that the uh, that the Earth goes around the Sun. The Bible says it doesn't. It's the opposite way. Uh, that but was, that doesn't justify their anger. I mean, Christians have been persecuted forever and ever and ever, and we forgive those who persecute us. Why don't atheists forgive? Oh, I uh, I I don't think that the anger that you're uh, talking about is, is based on necessarily on past deeds. Uh, in other words, let's take one example. Uh, it would be one thing if you're just believing in an invisible friend and you're convinced that that invisible friend exists and he created everything. It's something else when you want to uh, push onto everyone that concept in public schools. Uh, it's something else when you want to hold back science based on that particular concept. It's something else when you want to. Uh, but I don't. I don't see incredible anyone. numbers of people in Africa simply because you're not willing to accept uh, birth control and the only uh, and and other ways of fighting AIDS other than abstinence. But Larry, in this country. Uh, there is no one, well, most people are not trying to prevent atheists from being atheists. They can, they can believe in a lie. No one really cares. It's the atheists who are trying to impose their ideas or lack of ideas upon society. And so people are fighting back. And I, I don't understand why atheists won't just go and be an atheist and leave the world alone. Well, first of all, we certainly don't feel that atheism should be pushed in the, in, by government. We feel that government should stay out of religion. You've been arguing that because the majority of the people are Christian, that Christianity should be pushed on everyone in the public school. No, the but if you, don't, if you don't believe in religion, why do you care that government is involved in religion? Because I find it offensive to have these superstitious ideas shoved down my throat. But they don't force you to accept religion. Of course they don't. You could stay in your environment and never mention God and no one would care. Well, you know, you can talk about God all you want. You can talk about God in public meetings. You can talk about God in your speeches and your radio stations. You can talk about God all you want. The only time I have a problem is the time that if the situation reversed, you would have a problem, which is mainly when... Uh, Christianity is promoted by the public schools. You would have a problem if atheism were promoted by the public schools. Uh, I wouldn't have a problem with that as long as they didn't try to replace Christianity with atheism. Well, that's the nature of promoting atheism. You can have both if you want. But that's that's atheists, the nature of promoting atheism. But atheists, about, atheists do not want Christ or God mentioned at all. And if you're talking about a multicultural, multi-religious threaded uh, education, I'm all for that. I have no problem with that. Let's teach comparative religions. Do you believe, what will happen to you once you die? Do you believe there's a hell? Oh, no. Uh -uh. I think once my brain ceases to get oxygen and other nutrients from the blood, yeah. uh, I cease to exist. Where do your conflict come from? Comes from? Why do you have conflict? Why do I have conflict? Why, why do you have inner conflict? Inner conflict. Uh, what exactly are you getting at? You, you said that you don't have a conscience because you evolved from animals, right? From apes. I said I don't have a conscience. Do you have a conscience? Yeah. And, but that conscience is not from God. No. Uh, that conscience is human. See, I listen to you and I hear you taking human values and you're transferring over to this invisible friend. 
I don't do that. <laughs> human values are human values. If you want to have your invisible friend, that's fine. I can assure you that if you read uh, the philosophy of morality, almost no moral philosopher mentions God. When you look at the world around you, Larry, mm -hmm. you don't see that there is a God at all. Not at all, no. Not Have at all. Have you seen him? Oh, yeah. There is a, I'm convinced that there is a guy. Well, you've seen him. You've physically seen him. I also seen the devil, too, Larry. You, you've seen a guy with horns and no, tail? And just an the, just a evil spirit of the devil. The evil spirit? Yeah, of the so prince, of, of, the prince of darkness. Consider, when you see things you, you consider evil, you are convinced that that means the devil exists. Do you believe, you, do you believe evil exists or no? Um... I try not to use the word, because I think it's too absolute. Do you believe evil exists? I try not to use the word, because I think it's too absolute. But so you, I guess the answer to be directly is no, it's too simplistic a notion. Was uh, Hitler, uh, how would you classify Hitler? <clears throat> I would classify Hitler as a crazed egomaniac who wanted to control uh, everyone in society by a militarization based on corporation control and who basically uh, wanted to emulate the model that Christianity presented in uh, eliminating dissent. He murdered millions of Jews, men, women, and children. Yeah, he certainly Was did. that an evil act or something else? It was wrong. It was it wrong. Was extremely but, wrong. But not evil. I don't like the term. You don't like my term? No, I don't like the word evil. And why don't you like the word evil? Because it's too simplistic and absolute. Oh, so you don't like simplicity? Yeah. You like confusion. <laughs> I like complexity. <laughs> oh, you simplicity do? Simplicity is not the opposite of uh, confusion. Uh, the opposite of confusion is... Um, hmm. Simplicity. No, no. At any rate... Uh, what is the opposite of confusion? You didn't tell me. I don't really want to get into the semantics of it. It's simplicity and you don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, confusion. <laughs> What's the opposite of confusion? Uh, a lack of confusion? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can't think of the exact word that describes it well. Are you married, Larry? Uh, I, I was married for 10 years. My wife died two years ago. You have kids? No, uh, uh No children. Mm -mm. Uh, well, I, I, if, we use the word if, you had children, would you teach them atheism or Christianity or nothing? I would keep them away from religion and basically just teach them human values until they became probably 12 or 13. And then at that point, I'd try to take them to different churches and let them... Uh, see what different religious ideas are, and also let them see uh, what the whole argument of atheism and science is. I would try to teach them how to think skeptically rather than trying to brainwash them. Are you happy? Are you a happy person? Generally, yes. And sometimes no? Sometimes no. Why sometimes no? Well, as I said, my wife died two years ago. I'm sorry to hear that, Larry. And... Larry, what is the purpose of your organization in the few minutes we have left together? What's the purpose of your organization? Well, we are just a atheist organization in the East Bay of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. We meet in Berkeley once a month. Our purpose is to provide community and companionship and, and educational events for atheists and also to uh, organize them to stand up for their rights so that they don't have to feel ashamed about the fact that they're atheists, that they lack God, God belief. Uh, what we really focus on is the separation of religion and government. Very important to us. And you think that's right to do that, right? Oh, yeah, yes. As a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, we're really uh, happy that Pete Stark, a representative from the Fremont area uh, of California in Congress, recently came out and identified himself as lacking a belief in God. I just read about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you, wasn't that a crazy idea? What's crazy about it? For him to, I mean, 
he's going to regret doing that. Don't you agree? Well, uh, I know some people who attended uh, his town hall meeting uh, about a week after he came out in Fremont, and uh, he, there was not one person who said anything negative to him. He got over 500 letters after he did it, and about 20 of them were negative. And the rest were atheists writing him? Well, atheists or just people who respect conscience and feel that uh, one should be able to say what they what they feel is right. I mean, for example, if Pete, if this were an atheist country and Pete Stark were actually a Christian, uh, I would think that it would be admirable for him to come out of the closet and identify himself as a Christian. Well, I guess, you know, in government nowadays, you have the homosexuals coming out of the closet and saying that they, are, uh, they represent the homosexual uh, section of the population. I guess you can have an atheist, too. There's actually if a we are self homosexuals between gays and uh, non-religious people. There's a what? There's an it's an excellent analogy between gays and non-religious people because uh, you don't really know just seeing a person if they're gay, and it's the same thing about atheists. Well, I think the one thing that homosexuals and atheists have in common is that they don't believe in God. Well. That's not necessarily true. In fact, probably the majority of gays, and this is just a, a I don't even should probably even say probably. I suspect that the majority of gays do in this country do believe in God simply because um, no, the they don't. Is, believes in God. You However, can't believe in God, uh, Larry. Now they may believe about God, and and there are some who are homosexuals and don't want to be that way. And I will give a little more leeway to them, but those who think homosexuality is good do not believe in God. They may believe about him. They heard about him, and they may believe about him, but they do not, as atheists, they do not believe in him. And the reason is because Leviticus outlaws homosexuality? No, because you can't think that evil is good. If you believe in God, you know you can't serve evil and good. But how do you know that homosexuality is evil? Well, the the spirit of it is it, it 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 takes away your manhood, or if you're a woman, it takes away your womanhood. It takes away the identity of God within you, and that's not good. Well, most Christians uh, refer to Leviticus as uh, condemning homosexuality, and that's the basis for uh, their rejection. Well, that's true too. You know, the Bible does speak against it, but common sense dictate that is not of God. Larry, is there a website or something you want to give out to the people? EastBayAtheist.org, also San Francisco Atheist, uh, also American Atheist. .org. Mm-hmm. All right, Larry, you've been a great guest. Thank you for coming on with us today. Oh, thank you. All right, have Bye-bye. a good one. Okay, folks, that was the Atheist. It's amazing. Don't touch the dial. We have another excited guest coming up for you in this last hour right after this break. Back in a moment.